Like many city dwellers, it's long been my dream to escape the urban sprawl, find a little place in the country, and live off the fat of the land, thriving on whatever I can grow, gather, or catch. It's a dream no longer, because I've found River Cottage, the perfect place to create a miniature small holding and put my fantasy to the test. Only one thing stands in my way, a charming and well-kept flower garden. Now, I like flowers as much as the next man, but there's no room for passengers in this garden. The rule is, if it doesn't put something on my plate, I'm afraid it's got to go. The former flower beds are all going to be turned over to edible crops. And to maximize my growing space in the steeply sloping garden, I'm building terraces with railway sleepers. Well, it may just be a pile of virgin soil, but I'm pretty excited about my vegetable garden. I'm not a vegetarian, though. And the other thing I want to do is lay down some meat futures. That means getting some livestock on the place. One vestige of the urban life is my 1965 Ford Corsair. Maybe not the perfect downsizer's car, but with a trusty trailer tacked on, I feel ready for anything. Just a few miles from River Cottage is Peggy Davil's rare breed pig farm. Her prize-winning porkers are some of the finest in Dorset. Hello, Ginger Love. Hello. Hello, Ginger Love. Hello. So, is it really sensible for me to take a pig home, fatten it up at home, and slaughter it? Is that something that anyone can do if they've got the space? Yes, there's yeah. no problem there. As long as, you know, you, it's common sense a lot of it. Um, but you must feed it properly. You can't just put it on an open field and let it just have grass. It has to have a proper compound with its minerals to keep it healthy. Is it all right to have one pig on its own? No, not really. No, animal welfare, really, you're not allowed to. They need a pair, because they're very social animals. So you're going to try and sell me two pigs? Yes, certainly. <laughs> so that's good for business. Yes, very good, isn't it? Not only am I getting so twice as many now. pigs as I'd bargained for, Peggy's eight-week-old wieners are rather larger than I'd expected. They're like a dog. You let them get friendly with you. Let them come to you. Right. Naturally. He's got, his, he's got his nose in my pocket. <laughs> yeah, look, that's their way of saying, I'm not sure about you. <laughs> You're going to have your look, shoe off in look. a minute, or your trousers. <laughs> That is typical of a Gloucester old spot. I think it's these two, really, These isn't it? two? Yes, please. My multi-purpose trailer's been deemed unsuitable for pig carriage. So Peggy lends me hers and gives me a much-needed lesson in Can pig persuasion. The deal's done, and with a bag of feed thrown in, the three of us head back to our new home. From my previous experience of having sole responsibility for the welfare of livestock, there's two sticklebacks that I kept in a glass jar. I changed the water and I gave them fresh crumbled cornflakes every day. They both died within a week. So I think we could be on quite a steep learning curve here. Come on. Come on. Peggy compared pigs to dogs, but I'm already so beginning to sense just... that obedience classes with my old spots could be a long haul. Don't worry. If only they knew just what luxury awaits them, a straw-laden pig ark and a shady little copse beside the cottage to root and romp in. 
Come on. Come on, that's a good chap. Vocal oh, persuasion has proved quite ineffective, and a more hands-on approach is clearly called for, which gives the piglets a chance to demonstrate their impressive vocal range. Let me see what I've got for you. Look! Look at that. Now that's not so bad, is it? That's not such a bad place to be. I'm going to get you something to eat. With the old spots fed and watered, I'm feeling a bit peckish myself. But somehow it feels like a fish day, not a meat day. Downsizers will take anything they can get, especially when it's free. River Cottage is only a couple of miles from the coast, which means, in theory, the whole of the West Dorset marine larder is up for grabs. The problem, of course, is getting the fish out of the sea and into the kitchen. So you need some stomach muscles for this. Yeah, a little bit of a six-pack might help. Right, oh, reach the rubber. OK. Yeah. And then pull it right back. Till it clicks to the notch. Go on a bit further. Ah, I almost got there. <laughs> You'll be doing that on the surface. Gary right, Fuchs so is a fellow downsizer and a deadly shot with a spear gun. So I'd better do that. Yeah. I'd better make sure I can get there. Because there's not much point in getting in the water. Right, you can do it. Yeah. Oh. Well done. Right, one thing you will find is uh, the gun, because of its length, that trying to, at, a, at an arm, arm's length, trying to track something like that through the water, you actually get a lot of water resistance right. from it. So if, for instance, say a fish is swimming across that way and you want to track it quickly, two hands, pull it across, get the gun ahead of the fish, I aiming ahead of the fish, then take the hand away and then shoot. Gary's favourite hunting ground is over the rocky reefs off the shore of Portland Bill. It's one of the most amazing places to be. It's, it's another world. It really is another world. You need to know the environment. You need to know the fish you're hunting. You need to have the fitness and the ability to be able to hold your breath, go explosively after something, and uh, get yourself back to the surface safely. We're diving at high tide when, in theory, bass and mullet should be coming inshore to feed. The only thing I've seen is a tiny wrasse. But Gary spotted something that I haven't. A grey mullet, the perfect size for a barbecue. Very brilliant. Brilliant shot, Gary. Fantastic. I might have had one myself, except for some hopeless fumbling with the safety catch. And after half an hour, I'm knackered. As the inexhaustible Gary hunts on, I finally mastered my spear gun as a fish scaler. Once shot of me, Gary has a field day, returning as the sun goes down with two good-sized bass. Preparation of the mullet falls to me. How are you going to do the mullet then, Hugh? I'm going to treat it very lovingly. You see these, this bundle of twigs? Yeah. This is a dried-up version. Oh, this, right. which is fresh in the garden now. Dried fennel. If you smell that... Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that on my fire that I made yeah. here. And the idea is that the, the burning fennel puts a sort of smoky, fennel-y flavour into the fish. Yeah. yeah. So it's that simple. That's and then simple. Yeah, I've nothing got else, a, just fennel. Well, a little bit of fresh fennel. Right. And the only other thing is a bay leaf, which I just think almost every fish should just have a bay leaf in its cavity. My favourite thing to go in fish cavities is uh, that. Ah, so where I've got bay leaf, you've got little slithers I've of got fresh root ginger. I've got slithers of fresh root ginger stuck in there, yeah. So are you going kind of oriental yep. right through here? Ah, uh, yeah, totally and utterly. It's just uh, steamed fish with ginger and spring onion oyster sauce and uh, a little twist at the end. It's quite nice. It's a bit of a poncy dish for a barbecue, isn't it? It is, yeah, but it's my favourite way to eat bass. Right. I get the fish. With a bay leaf in its Let's belly, the mullet goes on the fire. 
Gary's wok fits snugly on his pot-bellied barbecue, perfect for steaming his bass. So if you, if you didn't shoot such a big fish, they'd fill in your pan <laughs> easily. The fierce heat of the barbecue cooks both fish within minutes. By the time my mullet's turned over, Gary's bass are out of the wok and getting their garnish of spring onions, coriander and oyster sauce. My mullet just needs salt and pepper. Gary's final flourish is to crackle the skin of his bass with a basting of boiling oil. That's brilliant. So you don't take the fish to the oil, you take the oil no, to the fish? No, you take the oil to the fish. There we go. Steamed bass, ginger and spring onion, oyster sauce. Fresh mullet roasted over dried fennel mm. with fresh fennel and lemon mayonnaise. Let's drizzle that over. I think I'm coming in with my sticks. Got a pair for me? Oh, I've got a pair for you. Right, I'm into your mullet. Oh, let me um, cross mm. over. That's good. That is beautiful. Yeah? Mm. While our catch is reduced to skeletons, Gary's friends arrive with fresh supplies for the barbecue and intent on a party. Well, for you to be down here in Dorset doing this, I mean, that is a choice for you. Oh, you? sure, you've, you've, yeah. you've tried town as well. Yeah, yeah. Three years ago, it was a case of all week working in town, and then at the weekends, packing up the family in the van, rushing down here. And then just stood out on the rocks, watching the waves crashing, thinking, why? I don't want to be on that tube tomorrow morning. I want to be here. That's what we did. We just, like, packed up and left and came down here. It was fantastic. No regrets. Every day. No regrets at all. It's beginning to feel like the good life really could be within my grasp. Michael and Joy Michaud have 15 acres of land on the West Dorset Cliffs. They farm organically and grow an amazing variety of vegetables. If I'm going to produce anything worthwhile on my humble plot, I could use some advice and inspiration. This is a sort of leguminous rainforest. And vegetables don't come any more inspiring than the ones in Joy and Michael's polytunnel. These aren't um, normal peas that you pod and eat the, just the pea. These are sugar snap peas, and you eat the whole oh, pod yeah. like that. Um, but there are some varieties which are sugar oh, snap. So good. Oh, they're very sweet. You must mm -hmm. feel so good when you just pull something off uh, your own bushes. We and love it. Yes. I mean, our children come in and they just sort of virtually graze in the, in the crops, just eat them raw. Yes. Now this is what I want. This mm -hmm. is what I want to do. We're basically lazy gardeners. I mean, this look. This is a lot of work. It's done in the winter when we don't have much going on anyway, but for the summer we, we tend to do just as little as we possibly can. Is that is that an option for me? I mean, can I be a lazy gardener Absolutely. and grow plenty of food to eat, enough to really cook some exciting Ex yeah. stuff? Yeah, no problem at all. It's only May, so they'll come on very fast. Yeah, yeah I'm never quite so sure about the slugs, though. I think they can't... Um... No, we don't eat I love the idea of being idle, organic and productive. <laughs> Michael's come back to River Cottage to get me started with some seeds and seedlings. But tell me honestly, how, how good is this? Can I do stuff with this? No, oh, this is smashing. Really? So you, are you telling me, Michael, that you're actually a little bit envious of yes, the, my I would, soil? Yes, I would I'm like. I'm going to take a bucket of this home with me. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Now, where's the sun? The where's south? South is this way. Okay, so, so this... you're not going to get much shading from those trees. You just got to watch. You know, we just got to watch it. But in the summer, the, the sun should be quite high. But we just have to watch out. You might want to put, you know, you might want to see where the shade's going to be and put mm. your leafy greens there because they oh, don't yeah. need as much sunlight. And what you want to do is put crops like tomatoes, courgettes, all your fruit stuff, put it in as much sun well, as this, you can. This gets a lot of sun. That, yeah. Okay, then I would put sort of courgettes, tomatoes, mm -hmm. uh, those sorts of things. First in is my favorite vegetable, the broad bean. We've got plenty of seed. Why don't you put two on each one? I like to put two just in case the slugs get them. Okay. If you've got two, one for you, one for the slug, all the way down. Yeah, two of them come up, then we can always thin one down, yeah? 
and I think that'll do just fine. Next along my top terrace, bulb fennel, also beloved of the slug. We did a tray of it one time. 150 plants came up. One night, slugs ate 140 of them. We ended up with 10 plants. No. Yeah. It's starting to make it's, me nervous now. I got very excited dark, when we started planting. It's an ugly now. scene out here. It's like, it is like a battlefield. Beetroot should thrive in my virgin soil, along with two types of potato, the ratte and the pink fur apple. Michael's also given me peas, corn, tomatoes and assorted greens. And before leaving, he casts his eye over his side of the barter deal. One river cottage ham, payable early autumn. Do you want to get a permanent marker out and uh, write your name on? No, that's OK. No? It doesn't matter. I'll just, I'll, you mind if I stop by periodically, though, just to check on their progress? No, not at all. <laughs> I think, I think things are starting to sort of look up. I feel with the vegetables, the seeds in the ground, my pigs in their pen, I'm sort of more or less starting to feel like a proper small holder, albeit a first timer. Yeah, it is coming along. My nearest neighbours to the cottage are Anthony and Serena Hitchens. I think you could still go higher, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah, right. I think that's right. Despite appearances to the contrary, the Hitchens have a bit of a problem. I'm hoping I may be able to help them out and acquire something for my pot in return. Their problem is overpopulation. Well, Hugh, this is where we should find the pigeons of the morning. And they sit up on the roof top of the stables. If they line up. They line up very in a very obliging, obliging manner. Yes. But this is not, you must clearly understand, a sporting activity. It's just a cull. We started with four pigeons about seven or eight years ago. We were given by four. some friends, just four. And how many have you got now? About 80. They're not all on display, but uh, they're far too many. So do you mm. see it as a sort of dual thing? You've got the lovely ornamental white doves, which, as you say, look very beautiful on the lawn up against the green. But you've also got a fairly regular supply of, of good dove meat. Well, I don't think it would keep body and soul together but it's a nice addition to the diet from time to time. They are pigeons, not doves. They're white, you see. That's why well, I keep white. thinking I mean, of no have lovely white doves, but doves are smaller they and are a slightly of, different shape. Is there a big sort of interbreeding problem? Well, there's a, I wouldn't call it a problem, but they do interbreed. Obviously, they interbreed with carrier pigeons who come through, and they interbreed with, uh, with the local wood pigeons. And my basis of selection, if I'm coming out to shoot one or two for the pot and to keep the numbers down, is to shoot the ones that are mixed so that we keep a, as pure a white uh, collection of uh, pigeons as we can. Well, do you want to show the way here? I'll do my best. For an efficient and humane cull, the preferred weapon is a 2 2 rifle. He seems to have gone. Yep, that's one down. And the question is will they come back? Uh, you don't see it quite as much in England as you do in France, but in France every decent-sized house has a pigeonnier, mm. which is a little tower in which the pigeons live. And uh, they would sally out every day to eat the crop and then come back and get shot by the Lord of the Manor. Uh, I, I take a rather more generous approach by feeding them instead of sending them out to... Feeding them and then shooting <laughs> them, yeah. Well, your turn now, Hugh, and see if you can uh, take one cleanly off the roof ridge of the stables. Yeah, it looks very effective to me. Are they good eating? They're perfectly good eating. They're very nice pigeons. And do you have a favoured way of cooking them? Well, don't ask me about cooking. <laughs> <coughs> well, I'll try I'm and I'm a totally come. unreconstructed male. I don't do that kind of thing at all. Not involved in the kitchen at Not all? Not involved in the kitchen at all. The idea is that if I continue to cull throughout the summer, I get to keep whatever I shoot. Sounds good to me? Steady. Steady. Yeah. Now, uh, perhaps we ought to go and pick up what we've shot. Yeah. Well, I'll try and come up with something that's a little bit unusual. Perhaps you and Serena would like to come around and sample. I think that's a lovely idea. We'll, uh, we'll bring the carrot. That's a very good idea. Why not? You bring the wine. That's an excellent idea. Having promised Anthony something unusual, I'm looking to North Africa for inspiration and making a rich and exotic layered pie called a pastilla. The plucked pigeons get their wings snipped off, and then I cut out the plump breasts, the only really decent bit of meat on these birds. 
But the carcasses don't go to waste. Roasted, they make a fantastic stock. After bubbling away on my wood-burning stove for three hours, it's strained and then reduced. These are literally just going to get very, very lightly browned because the actual cooking is going to happen inside the pie. We just want them to take on a little bit of colour, a little bit of flavour. My scrambled eggs need to be good and creamy. They're going to go in slightly sloppy. They have to have a pouring consistency, no jelly, just a nice pouring consistency to spread over the pie. This is the stock, which has now been reduced literally to about three tablespoons. So that's three of the layers of the pie, and the fourth layer, it's this kind of unusual thing, of toasted almonds mixed with icing sugar and cinnamon. So it's a pretty weird dish, really. You've got meat, you've got scrambled eggs, and you've got almonds flavoured with cinnamon and icing sugar. It's meat and sweet. It's a very sort of peculiar, spicy North African thing, but it is wonderful. My tart dish is covered with three base layers of phyllo pastry, each brushed with melted butter. It does feel very weird spreading out a layer of meat in a pie and then putting scrambled eggs on top. I mean, I can't think of any other time you do anything so bonkers. Before we do that, a little bit of parsley, a little bit of fresh chopped coriander go in the eggs. Look at that. Have you ever seen anything odder in a pie dish in your whole life? Just putting in an extra punch of flavour, this incredibly reduced sauce. It's going to trickle that over. I mean, that is almost black. It's practically chocolate sauce. The whole thing's looking like a sort of pudding, really, at the moment. And the last layer, toasted almonds mixed with icing sugar and cinnamon. It's ready to be wrapped up. First layer over. Now, my phyllo pastry may look a bit crumpled and torn. I really don't care. It doesn't matter. It's very forgiving stuff. It's all going to crinkle and crackle and crisp up beautifully in the oven. The final layers of phyllo are tucked in and the pastillas cooked in a hot oven for 25 minutes, turning halfway through. Are you coming to dinner? Are you coming to dinner? No, too? they're coming to breakfast shortly. <laughs> My guests, the Hitchens, arrive with neighbourly promptness. Ooh, Hugh. That's very smart. Now, uh, this is some four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. What is it? Well, I know it looks a bit like pudding. Does it taste a bit like pudding? It might taste a bit like pudding. It's a Moroccan dish. Oh, gosh. It's called pastilla. We're ethnic this evening, aren't we? Oh, that's yeah. Wonderful. Anthony's held up his side of the bargain, bringing with him a pretty decent 1981 claret. I must say, the smell is all right. Mm. The smell is definitely all right. It's quite a lot. Oh, lots of cinnamon on it. Crackling and good. exploding pastry going I on. like the cinnamon. Wonderful. Mm, that's very well. Good. well, you've left me a very good sized slice there. There you are. Well, I must say, good old English pigeon. He's dressed up in an amazing yeah. way. Mm. Yeah. Really good. It's very, very tasty. But it's, the mm. meat itself is absolutely mm. delicious. And you've got it like... We were Have you had any of our rabbits yet? You've got rabbits as well as we've pigeons. We've got a vast amount of rabbits. We've got rabbits. Everybody's got rabbits. I'm pleased that you cull our pigeons, but I'd be delighted if you cull our rabbits. Next week, I'll be finding out that chickens come before eggs, Latvian ladies know how to party, and the bath is the only place to unwind.